Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank welcome to the January 22 meeting of ASSA Queensland. All of our members and all your interstate people as well, it's good to have you. COVID's again knocked over our usual physical meetings at Archerfield. Perhaps we can recommence meetings at Archerfield in a few months' time. But our recent uh, management committee meeting, it was decided that for the next few months, that's January, February and March, we'll be Zoom meetings, Zoom only. And newsletter editor, Jeff Nelson, will be putting out a new, new look, new name newsletter, Downwind. The first edition of Downwind should be out tomorrow. HSA Queensland's AGM will be held on Wednesday, 23rd of February by Zoom, the AHSA Q members only this is. It'll be followed by a members chat night. Nominations for the committee positions will be closing on the 4th of February. The RAF Heritage and History Department have published a new book, Then, Now, Always. Peter Dunn has a copy of the new book. I got it's quite a tome. Uh, Peter Dunn's got a copy and uh, he received a couple of weeks ago. He can tell us about it and he takes over in a few minutes. Um, our speaker tonight is our hardworking secretary, Peter Dunn, OAM, owner and webmaster of the website ozatwar.com. He will be telling us shortly about the Townsville Air Depot, the largest repair and supply facility in the Southwest Pacific area during World War II. Next month, 25th of February, we plan to have Dr. Tom Lewis, OAM, his topic will be Japanese aviators who stayed. In March, the Robert Heathwood the flying will be talking about the flying padre. We've got many other presentations lined up for the next half year. And uh, that's great. With no further ado, I'll hand you over to Peter Dunn. Welcome, Peter. Thanks, Warwick. Um, before I start, there's that book. Uh, it's humongous. It's um, quite thick and extremely heavy. Um, I think someone said it weighs three kilos. I don't know if that's right, but it covers the 100 years uh, history of the, uh, of the Air Force. So let's get underway. So there's a nice color photo from World War II. Um, that's a, it's not a colorized photo, that's a, a genuine color photo uh, taken at the Air Depot with uh, Castle Hill in the background. It's a Time Life magazine uh, photo. So um, many people in Townsville incorrectly call uh, this depot the fourth air depot. It'll become obvious why shortly. It was actually not the fourth air depot at all. Uh, the US military telephone directory that I've got dated May 1944 calls it the fifth air, air force service command depot number two. So it was the second air depot. Other common names used were Number 2 Air Depot or the Townsville Air Depot. The 4th Air Depot was actually located in Darwin and there's plenty of files in the National Archives uh, online um, describing the construction activities for the 4th Air Depot which was located in Darwin. The confusion started because the first um, unit, main unit that was located at the depot was called the 4th Air Depot Group, the 4th Air Depot Group. So that's where the confusion started. So you should see a photo here at Archfield of a B-17, B-17D in fact. So believe it or not, this B-17D Flying Fortress was instrumental in the early development of the Townsville Air Depot. In mid-November 1941, Major General Lewis H. Brereton left the Philippines in his B-17D, that one there, and visited Bachelor Airfield, Port Moresby, Rabaul and Townsville. He then flew on to Brisbane, landing at Archfield, on his way to Melbourne for top-secret high-level meetings with senior Australian military officials. He left his B-17 at Archfield and his party flew south in a B-18 Bolo and a Lockheed Hudson. Uh, and the reason for that was that they'd been told that southern airfields were not large enough to take his B-17, which I don't think really was true. Uh, Brereton and his party, um, while they were on this top secret mission uh, to Australia, remained dressed in civilian clothes for the whole time of their visit. Brereton met with the Chief of the Air Staff, Air Vice Marshal George Jones, who you can see down the bottom left there, 
his deputy and other senior officials regarding a number of projects that he wanted to initiate in Australia uh, because they were reasonably sure that the Japanese were up to something. And so this, as I said, was um, mid-November 41, uh, a couple of weeks before Pearl Harbor, two weeks in fact before Pearl Harbor. So the projects that he discussed with these officials down south, the two in particular that are relevant to, to tonight's talk, is project number one, which was to establish an aircraft erection depot in Townsville, and project number two, to establish a major repair and supply depot in Townsville. So here you can see another view of um, Brereton's B-17 parked at Archfield, and in the background you can see uh, what was called Camp Archfield, uh, the RAAF's Camp Archfield, that was located in the far southeast corner of Archfield Airfield. I, I did this slide today actually uh, because there's a lot of people who, who don't live in Townsville uh, listening to this talk and I thought I'd give you the lay of the land. So here's Garbutt Airfield, if you fly into Townsville you generally come in across the top of the air depot and land on this runway here. Um, uh, the city area here, the Strand, the army base, the old army base at Kissing Point, um, the harbour, Cleveland Bay, Maggie Island's up the top off the screen. Uh, you can see another airfield here. This is Ross River Airfield. Uh, I can remember riding my push bike out to that when I was a kid to watch the, uh, the tiger moths uh, land and take off there. So. Here we go, project number one, the aircraft erection depot in this location here. In this photo, it's actually been already built. This is a July 1942 photo. However, the air depot, the main part of the air depot, the repair and supply depot, uh, has not been built in this photo. And it occupies all this area here and, and on the south, southern side of this airstrip just here which is the stock route airstrip. Today it's Dalrymple Road. And just to the west of project number two, uh, beside Mount Louisa, which is here, uh, was the camp area for about three to 4,000 men. And just to the north of that camp, er or north, northwest, was a large motor pool. So that sort of gives you a bit of an overview. Um, you can see, um, hopefully you can see, a number of lines crossing here on Garbutt Airfield where the buildings and that are. That's a sort of a camouflage that they did during the war, I think, to make it look like a cemetery. Uh, here's a closer view, and, and this is a later um, aerial photo after the war. So this is a 1952 aerial photo. So that I can try to give you a bit of an overview of where the air depot was. So Garbutt Airfield, um, Ingham Road heading north, it's actually heading west, but it's heading to northern cities. The railway line, sort of parallel to Ingham Road, and Duckworth Street. So remember Duckworth Street? That became a major taxiway from Garbutt Airfield down to the air depot and to this uh, Stockard airstrip. You can see a hangar here and another hangar just here. So this was Project 1 the Aircraft Erection Depot. That was up and running by July 1942. This was not built by then, um, so it sort of goes down and below the Stockard airstrip and across here, and there's hangars everywhere through the bush here. Uh, and here's the remnants of the camp area just over here in 1952. Um, I just want to go back uh, to this first picture. Um, some of you might have, might have noticed that I've got a red star here. Jeff Nielsen will probably know why, because uh, that's where Jeff and myself lived across the road from each other when we were growing up um, after the war, obviously, and in Hague Street at Pimlico. So we, we weren't too far from, uh, from that air depot. I used to ride my push bike out there all the time. Okay, here's uh, another close-up view of the air depot in operation. So this is the repair hangar area. And if you want to read a great book, in fact, it's the best book I've ever read. It's about a young boy named Rod Cardell who grew up to be a doctor in Nambour. 
and he grew up in the mid living in the middle um, of the large towns of Air Depot. Uh, he lived, I don't know if it's that house, but it's one of these houses here, possibly that one. Uh, and it's a great book. Um, you can see the, some butler combat hangars um, that have been built on top of uh, the Stockard airstrip a bit later in the war in this photo. And I might mention that I've also got a e-book out on Amazon, Barnes and Noble and Apple uh, on and others on the Townsville Air Depot as well. Um, Duckworth Street here, uh, which goes sort of to the back door of uh, Garbutt Airfield, and you can see those cross lines there, was upgraded in January 1942. So the road was regraded uh, and electricity supply was run down the street. Um, the 3,600 foot Stockroot airstrip in here, running from here to here roughly, was graded and gravelled in March 1942 and Duckworth Street then became a major taxiway between the Stockroot airfield and Garbutt airfield. The other thing of interest in this photo, this is a July 42 photo, is you can see a rectangular block of dirt here and a road leading into a hut. That's the RAAF's high frequency direction finding station uh, that was quite active during the three Japanese bombing raids on Townsville. Uh, on the 24th of January 1942, two Wirraways of 24 Squadron, RAAF, taxied down, um, down Duckworth Street, past the aircraft direction hangars you can see here, uh, and parked 75 metres from Rod Cardell's house, somewhere in here. On the 24th of March, 24 Squadron set up their headquarters behind their house, somewhere back here. And on the 28th of March, some B-26 Marauders of the 19th Bomb Squadron, 22nd Bomb Group, US Army Air Force, flew over the top of Rod's house and landed at Garbutt Airfield. They then taxied from the airfield over here down uh, Duckworth Street at high speed, typical Yanks, and parked on the northern side of the Stockroot uh, airfield in front of Rod Cuddell's house, or his parents' house. 24 Squadron left the area on the 18th of June, 42, and 33 Squadron RAAF, a transport squadron, moved from Mount St John airfield into the area in about July 1942 with their Avro Ansons, Oxfords and Tiger Moths. Now the um, St. John, St John's airfield was, so there's Garbutt airfield, it's over here in the swamps over to the, to the left, um, about one or two kilometres. And in this photo, if you look carefully, and I've labelled it anyway, you can see two aircraft parked on this uh, road here, I don't know what the name of that road is. Uh, here's a plan of the Aircraft Direction Depot. Um, it was completed sometime, as I said, prior to July 1942 as part of project number one. Uh, and you can see hang one hangar here and another hangar just here. And you've seen um, this one in particular a couple of times in some of those photos. And there's that HFDF station. And on this plan, you can see all the ancillary buildings associated with project number one or the Aircraft Direction Depot. The, <clears throat> excuse me, so this is July 42 again, and there's your two hangars there and there. The hangars and support buildings for this Aircraft Direction Depot were built by the Townsville Harbour Board. Um, 19th Bomb Squadron B-26 Marauders relocated to away from uh, down here near Cardell's place to Woodstock Airfield on the 4th of July, 1942. And one day, uh, Rod witnessed a B-17 Flying Fortress land on the Stockroot airstrip in front of his place here and watched a taxi uh, to Garbutt Airfield along Duckworth Street. In October, 1942, work started on project number two to build the air depot in this area here and below the Stockroot Air airfield down there. So there's a B-17 uh, on the Stockroot airfield. I don't know if it's the one that Rod saw that day, but um, uh, you can see Castle Hill there in the background. That's probably a very early 1942 photo uh, when the 435th Bomb Squadron arrived. And this 
is definitely a 435th Bomb Squadron aircraft. Uh, I got this photo from Bruce Gamble, the, uh, the well-known author. Um, it's a photo of B-17E miscarriage, number 41-2645 of the 435th Bomb Squadron, better known as the Kangaroo Squadron of the 19th Bomb Group. And there it is on um, Duckworth Street, waiting for a train uh, to go past as it's taxiing from Garbutt Airfield towards the Stockroot Airfield. Again, that would be in very early um, 1942. It's a shot of the Stockroot Airfield on the right there, which is now Dalrymple Road with Castle Hill in the background. 30 squad, 36 Squadron RAAF arrived at the Stockroot Airfield with their DC-2s. Uh, they later changed to DC-3s in December 1942, and they stayed there for 15 months. And here's a close-up of that DC-2. It's uh, number A30-6. And this was an incident after the port undercarriage collapsed on landing. That airfield was sealed sometime between December 1942 and January 1943. And you can see one of the hangars, one of the far eastern hangars of the air depot in the background here. Okay, here is the same aircraft erection depot area, project number one, again July 42, and I've highlighted uh, the two hangars here just to uh, have a point of reference. And if I now click, you now see a, a more modern, it's getting a bit old now though, um, aerial view of what exists there today uh, along Duckworth Street. But you can still see... Um, you know, the pad of uh, one of those hangars there. So I'll just go back and forth. So Dalrymple Road was the airfield. Um, <clears throat> this is a different view of the aircraft erection depot in April 1944. Much closer view and north is no longer to the top. North is now sort of to the right, more or less. Uh, Duckworth Street running up towards uh, the back door entrance to Garbutt Airfield. Um, there's one of the hangars and there's the other hangar and by April 44 one of the butler hangars had been erected in front of this hangar um, at the aircraft erection depot. This photo gives you a good view of some of the uh, out, outbuildings, if you want to call them that, that were associated with um, the, uh, the aircraft erection depot. And you can see a heap of tents here that look like tents. I don't know whether they're tents or not, but they appear to be tents. And I don't know what that building is. Uh, if someone knows, please let me know. Um, so that's what the area looks like today. I'll just go back again. Uh, so you can see the outline of the uh, where the hangar was. This um, is a different building. The old hangar's been pulled down. And there's something else there. I don't know what's there today. I'm not sure. This photo's probably 10 years old. Some sort of industrial tank farm. Is it? Right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so very little is known about the aircraft erection depot. Uh, you know, I've got some photos, some really good photos, in fact. Uh, here you can see a P-39 Era Cobra uh, at the depot on the 4th of December 1942. And you can see the um, camouflage uh, paintwork on that hangar uh, in this photo. And there's a gentleman there walking around the side of the... The hangar has another, another view of, of um, one of those two hangars. I'm not sure whether it's the same as the one in the previous shot. Now here's the here's the hangar that's um, near the back door to um, Garbutt Airfield, and I took this photo in 1962 when the long-nosed Lincolns from 10 Squadron were being uh, scrapped for scrap metal. Uh, they've had their engines taken off, as you can see, but there's that old hangar from uh, World War II in that photo with Mount Louisa um, in the background there. Um, aircraft carrier USS Copahe unloaded a number of aircraft in Townsville Harbour between the 25th and the 28th of September 1943. It carried 45 A-20 Havocs, two Thunderbolts, two P-47 Thunderbolts, and eight P-40 Warhawks, as the Yanks call them. We call them Kitty Hawks. In this photo, you can see one of those aircraft uh, being a P-40 Warhawk 
uh, serial number 42-105732. Uh, USS Fanshawe Bay um, loaded um, many P-38 Lightnings in early January 1944 at Townsville Harbour uh, and they were towed to the Aircraft Direction Depot. USS Prince William unloaded aircraft at Townsville between the 7th and the 8th of May 1944. There were 17 P-38 Lightnings, 16 A-20 Havocs, 3 P-61 Black Widows and 15 P-47 Thunderbolts. So you can see a Thunderbolt here on the deck of Prince William. And this is in Townsville Harbour with Magnetic Island in the background and this is the southern breakwater. And you can see one of the World War II um, bunker, little bunkers that were erected <clears throat> on the uh, on the breakwaters. They're on both breakwaters. It's just starting to rain here, folks. Here you can see a P-38 Lightning, minus its outer wings and propellers, being towed down Boundary Road in Townsville, past the National Hotel. It's called a different name now. Then across Sandy Crossing to the Townsville Air Depot on the 8th of January 1943. Today, um, if you head where this thing's going, if you head over here, go over the railway line and straight ahead to Monkey Island, you'd be on the V8 racetrack uh, that, where they hold the V8 racing cars uh, each year in about July. Um, so this particular P-38, um, when you zoom in on the tail, was P-38G uh, number 43-2196 of the 9th Fighter Squadron, 49th Fighter Group, which later crashed on engine failure after takeoff in New Guinea on the 10th of October 1943. So it lasted for nine, nine or so months. Um, I don't know whether this is the same aircraft, but this is Sandy Crossing um, near Queens Road. Uh, on the 8th of January 1943. A photo here of someone cleaning a recently arrived A-20 Havoc at the Aircraft Erection Depot. Typically on arrival at the Aircraft Erection Depot, engines were cleaned of cosmoline, which was a brown coloured wax-like rust inhibitor. Wings and propellers were attached where needed. Guns and radios were installed. Landing gear and engines were checked. The aircraft was fuelled and test flown and the aircraft was then eventually assigned to an operational squadron. Uh, in some photos you'll see line up, uh, lineups of brand new aircraft ready to be picked up by operational squadrons lined up on Duckworth Street. Okay, here's a plan um, of, I guess, uh, not depot, not um, project number one, but project number two, uh, and shows the three main areas of the um, project number two of the repair and supply depot. Up the top here is the repair hangers and they're all numbered with an R in front. So R6, uh, a bit hard to read, R4, R5. And uh, on the southern side of, this is the Stockard airfield here, and that shows the Butler combat hangers uh, on that airfield at that time. But there are a couple of the uh, repair hangers on the southern side, only four of them. This one here, this one, it's R2 and R2A, I think it is, and R3 and R3D. And then the within the yellow circle, um, and probably a little bit further, are the warehouse hangers, and they all start with a W. So there's you know, W15, uh, etc. Um, and then to the left here, and this only shows part of a camp, it goes a fair way further, and then the um, motor pool up above it, uh, slightly to the left. So that's the camp area. Uh, just here is the H-shaped building for the Air Service Command Headquarters, which was an overall command group that uh, also based themselves uh, at this air depot. And the air depot groups that were here were part of that Air Service Command. The bit of back history, the 4th Air Depot Group arrived in Melbourne from the USA on the 1st of February 1942. Various detachments initially operated out of Geelong, uh, Brisbane, probably Eagle Farm or, or um, Archfield, West Footscray, uh, Wagga Wagga, Tokenwall, Broome, Archfield, Laverton, Essendon and Fisherman's Bend. 
Colonel Victor Betrandius was appointed as their commanding officer in September 1942 and the various those various detachments that were all over the place uh, came back together and arrived in Townsville on the 2nd of October, started to arrive in Townsville on the 2nd of October 1942. And their first job when they got there was to build their own air depot, so project number two. Project one had been finished in July and they were starting on project number two in October 1942 at the base of Mount Louisa. They lived in tents, um, as you can see in this photo here, and they operated from trailers right through to almost mid-1943 before they had all the, the uh, appropriate buildings uh, and hangars erected um, at the depot. Despite this, the first operational aircraft arrived for repairs on the 15th of November 1942. Remember, they only started to build it on the 2nd of October 1942. And engine overhauls got underway on the 8th of December 1942. So you can see all the all the tents uh, in the background here, quite extensive tents and some trailers in the foreground there. So the 4th Air Depot Group were assisted by the Queensland Main Roads Commission and also the US Army's 43rd Engineers to construct the depot uh, and mainly, mainly the large hangars. Four repair hangars and five supply, supply warehouses were initially erected and they were in use by the end of 1942. It quickly became clear that the, the demands placed on this air depot by the 5th Air, air Force far exceeded its capabilities and hence the depot continued to grow. Eventually, there were three air depot groups operating at the air depot. So there was the 4th Air Depot Group, the first to arrive, the 12th Air Depot Group, and then the 15th Air Depot Group. And at, towards the end there, all three air depot groups were operating uh, at this air depot. And as you can see in this photo, it's a big air depot. There's one of the aircraft erection depot, uh, hangars and the other one's up here somewhere. Um, and you can see a crane here and you can see earthworks um, here underway for uh, hangar 9, R9 to be built um, sometime in the future. What I've got here is a video showing some of the early supply hangars and operations at the air depot. It shows, shows the 43rd um, uh, group, um, engineers group, building uh, some of the hangars. Hopefully you'll hear the audio as Keeping well. Keeping track of sub now, we're in Tom Armstrong Paddock in Tom hey, speed up. There's yeah. Lieutenant Coster. Coster. There's I. Yeah. Well, there we are hard at work. Every place we stopped, somebody figured out something that we ought to be doing, so we built four of these uh, Air, Air Force uh, storage facilities, uh, and they were big. I don't, I don't remember the exact dimensions on them, but they were big. Each uh, each platoon had one to build, and then, then we, we wound up building four before we left there. I don't remember uh, these guys' names. No, that isn't cute. Uh, so this is color film from World War II. Well, I tell you, those guys are in shape, aren't they? You bet. You betcha. Hey, was that Zarbach that ran that mixer? I think it was. Yeah, I think that's he right yeah, there. Yeah, I believe it was old Zarbach. I think so. Uh, we, uh, we poured big foundations and then put those... Try to figure out where those pictures going by that fast. Uh, There's Towns and Moore looking over one of the Air Force buildings we're building. Steamroller. The old steamroller. There's Aunt Nelly. Yeah. So this must be the first platoon's hangar they're building. I think they built a soil, soil cement floor on theirs. I think Gebhardt run that old roller. Six 
six-wheel drive. Water tank. Yeah, it must be. Water in the Florida compact. And I suppose. Yeah, we put gravel down and yeah, mix, mix cement with it and then poured and water to it and compacted it. There's the water. Yeah. <laughs> Possessioned it. Yeah. There, there's uh, mixing up the cement and the, and the gravel on the soil cement floor. I didn't look like Clark to me. Gets a bit busy I'm inside this hangar. They go by so fast. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> it's, it's tough to. Uh, that's Tibbets, isn't Sneed. it? Sneed. Tibbets. Tibbets. Yeah. We call him General Sneed. <laughs> General Sneed bumped him on a plane one time when he was going, oh, really? going someplace, see, and so after that we always called him General Sneed. <laughs> that was how he got that. I didn't hear that before. Yeah, yeah he was going, going on and he got bumped. <laughs> I didn't hear that one. Yeah, that's why That's why they, where he picked up that name, Sneed. <laughs> I guess after that, that's about all you heard him call <laughs> You can see the beams there. The, there's uh, some of them there. They yeah. Up. I'm trying to remember what they're they call prefab. That, call that. Uh, they're Tommy Manners. He was. Uh, he was a heck of a good Tommy cement finisher. Really In fact, he was good at about anything you gave him. Yeah, to tell the truth. Him to do. He was one yeah. heck of a construction man. I just wonder how many of these guys would like to. Have the figure and the bills <laughs> now that they had in those days. Yeah. They were hard, boy. Those guys worked. Well, I'll say, boy. There's no fat on any of those birds. No, sir. There's yeah. Sergeant Mitchell on the yeah, left. Yeah. He didn't know that was he until I told him. Yeah. He didn't know he was ever that skinny. Mm. Gotta see him now. Yeah. <laughs> There's an Aussie that was a, one of our aides or something. There's Captain Moore and Lieutenant Townsend. Yeah. <clears throat> Some civilians. There's Tex. So this is a different film. To uh, tell her as well. To this air depot, That's the and, which was the southern terminus uh, for the Air Force. Uh, all of the repair work, assembling. Uh, if something was wrong, they sent it here to get it fixed or rebuilt or uh, uh, re remade. And uh, uh, this was sort of an R and R. We were getting back into field conditions, our outfit was to uh, uh, be placed on a, uh, uh, a, a, a Kaiser aircraft carrier and uh, sail to uh, an island that uh, uh, might have been just recaptured. And if a plane needed extensive work on it, they'd put it on a uh, barge and float it out the aircraft carrier, host it on board and get it fixed. A ration, a hogshead of beer, of course, it was cold and had to be promptly drunk on the spot. We had no way to keep it uh, cool for very long. One of the few film uh, on me. B-25 airplanes, after uh, many thousands of hours of combat, uh, have come in to be refurbished, cleaned up, and re-outfitted to go back in the field uh, uh, for the war effort. There's B-25s lined up. Note the 75 millimeter cannon in the nose of that front airplane. Uh, they were a murderous weapon installed uh, because the Japanese used a small 1,000 and 500 ton uh, uh, ships to uh, supply with, and uh, these airplanes were very effective. Some PBYs that uh, we had for search and rescue, what they were doing there, I don't know. There's the backup of fighter aircraft uh, we had uh, in inventory, as well as 
uh, some bombers uh, also. About that time, uh, rotation became a big issue, uh, and uh, uh, people with my experience were, or rather time, were being allowed to go back to the States uh, as having had enough. Uh, my papers came through. I headed for uh, Melbourne and uh, Melbourne, I mean uh, uh, Brisbane, got on the old Mariposa and uh, uh, headed back to the States in late October 1944 and uh, to home. Okay, um, repair and salvage area. So uh, here's quite a good uh, aerial photo uh, taken on the 24th of April 1944. You can see the uh, 11 butler hangars that were erected uh, at that later stage on the Stockroot airfield to allow more storage for the warehouse part of the air depot. Um, and that's what that same area looks like today. Um, so you've got Bunnings over here and Harvey Norman uh, on just off Duckworth Street and this is Dalrymple Road. I'll just go back again. So that's what it looked like. I used to ride my little push bike out to play around all these hangars when I was a kid. And that's what it looks like some years ago. Um, supply warehouse area. So this is the area south of the Stockroot airstrip. So this um, is a 1952 photo, I believe. Uh, and you can still see the remains of quite a few of those um, warehouse hangars. And as I mentioned, there are four of the repair hangars on the southern side uh, as well, near these uh, warehouse hangars. So there was R2, R2A, R3 and R3D. Sounds like a space alien. The thing to note here too, beside these three hangars here, just in this area here, the US Navy had a US Navy magazine uh, in that area. And I'll talk a little bit more about that a bit later. Um, there was a big hole dug here, which I'll talk about. The other thing of note in this photo is there's a railway line right beside the airfield. And that's a railway line that um, comes off the main line north at Garbutt, near the Garbutt where the Melinda Milk used to be, and goes around through the air depot, beneath uh, the air depot here, and then up on the eastern side of um, the warehouse hangars here, and runs up to the Hubert Wells uh, power station. And I'll talk about a railway siding a bit later on. So that's what that same area looks like today. So you've got um, Dalrymple Road up here. That um, railway line became a road by the looks of it. Suddenly there's a whole new suburb there. Okay, and we'll talk about this area here, this park, where that Navy magazine was a little bit later. Okay, Camp Mount Louisa. So this is a plan of the, um, the main barracks area uh, at um, Mount Louisa. There were um, three to 4,000 men um, living at that camp and they used to walk across the creek to the main uh, air depot area. I think it was called Pee Wee Creek from memory. Um, so if I click on that, that's a 1952 photo showing the remains um, of the uh, barracks area and the motor pool area up the top here. This is Mount Louisa, uh, just to the, to the west. And there's a creek here and there were numerous tracks leading across to the air depot. And you'll see some photos coming up shortly. This is a typical um, organisation structure for a typical air depot group. Um, the fourth air depot itself had the headquarters group and they also had a 4th depot repair squadron and 4th depot supply squadron but they also had a heap of other attached units and I'll show you some of those shortly. Um, I've got uh, a lot of records on US military forces, all their numbers and where they were in Australia during World War II for various years and I, I did a little uh, check to see how many people were at the depot at one point in time. So on the 8th of January 1944, uh, there were 59 officers and 1,572 enlisted men in the 4th Air Depot Group, 46,092, 12th Air Depot Group, 50 and 1,079 
giving you a total of almost 4,000 men uh, on the 8th of January 1944 based at that depot. And here's a fair few of them uh, here on parade. There's probably at least a thousand men in that photo. Um, that's probably a photo for a parade for General Douglas MacArthur possibly visiting uh, the depot one day on one of these um, uh, lunchtime uh, stopover uh, trips to Port Moresby. Uh, but also Mrs Eleanor Roosevelt, the President's wife, visited the depot on one occasion, so it could be that day as well. I don't know what, what it was. Here's one of the trailers that I mentioned earlier that they used um, as early as, you know, as late as mid-43. At the postal exchange, a mobile postal exchange in May 43. So here on a few slides here I give you an idea of some of the other units that were attached to their fourth air depot um, groups. I should have the word group there by the way. Um, so there was the headquarters and headquarters squadron of the fourth air depot group, the fourth depot repair squadron, second air service squadron, 83rd etc etc. Uh, and there were others as well, other minor units as well, you know, like chemical units, etc. This is the 12th Air Depot Group, who arrived in Townsville on the 14th of April, um, remembering that um, the other group, the 4th Air Depot Group, arrived on the, I think it was the 4th of October from memory, 1942. So these guys arrived April 43, and these are the main units that were attached to the 12th Air Depot Group. Again, there were other small units attached as well. Uh, 15th Air Depot Group arrived on the 18th of June, 43. Here's some of the main units that were attached to that Air Depot Group. This, that's just a frame grab from that earlier film footage that I showed you. So that's the headquarters for 5th Air Service Command um, Far East Air Forces uh, located at Depot uh, number two, not depot number four. <laughs> uh, so it was a large H-shaped building, and uh, as I showed you earlier, located at the southwestern end of a stock route airfield. A couple of the boys on their push bikes, uh, leaning up against the sign outside the headquarters. Mount Stewart in the back. Mount Stewart in the background. So <clears throat> this slide shows you all of the different. Um, workshop units, if you like, that were based at depot number two uh, at Mount Louisa. So you can see from this just how large this air depot was. And these are all the activities that it pursued at that depot. I'll just let, let you read that for a little while. Even had a dope shop. Okay, um, so this photo is taken in about 1943 before the Butler hangars were placed on the um, um, Stockard airfield. You can see uh, so, some of the RAAF dec um, Dakotas, I think, probably there near Rod Cardell's house. Whether that's Rod's or that's Rod's, I'm not sure. Peter Johnston might know. Um, and you can see some of the hangars uh, there. Future R9 hadn't been built by that stage. That's Duckworth Street. Uh, that's a couple of the repair hangars and the rest are the um, supply warehouses. Okay, in the foreground you can see a P-38 Lightning and a B-25 Mitchell. They're actually lined up on the Boar sighting range where they tested their guns after servicing. Note uh, in the background that Hangar R9 had not been built by that stage. Um, and you can see one of the aircraft erection depots there and Garbutt Airfield over in the background, Mount, uh, Magnetic Island in the far background. Um, earthworks had started to build that R9 um, hangar. You've got a lineup of B-25 uh, Mitchells in the foreground and a couple of B-24s over here and one of the uh, large crane located beside uh, hangar R1 and 
that's Duckworth Street running through there, heading towards uh, Garbutt Airfield this way. So Duckworth Street, Bayswater Road, um, Hangar R9's been built. It's there in all its glory. And guess what? It's got its own crane. So there's two cranes at the depot. Now, as you can see, there's large concrete aprons here and here. Concrete everywhere. Um, after the war, many young townsvillians, including myself, learnt to drive my car uh, on that on those large concrete aprons. It was very popular for learning to drive uh, your vehicle on. Uh, some Liberators there, some Dakotas there. Uh, are they Catalinas? I don't know, I can't see. Too hard to see. That's a cat there, Catalina. Um, those large concrete slabs were also used as staging points for at least one of the large car rallies. Um, it was either one of the Redux trials or one of the Ampol trials. Um, I can remember my father taking uh, us there one day to see all of the cars all lined up and all the, all the drivers and crew, etc. And some of you might remember that one of the characters of the Redux and Ampol trials was a fellow called Jellignite Jack Murray. He's that bloke up the top right there. He had a bit of a reputation for throwing sticks of je Jellignite uh, during the rally. Um, this is one of Arch Fraley's photos. Arch was a photographer in the US Army Air Force and he married a local girl and started a photographic studio in the city after the war. Uh, I think it was across the road from the police station from memory. Um, he certainly took our family photos um, and a number of his photos uh, have been on display at the Townsville Airport for quite a number of years now. Um, so this is one of his photos. Again, you can see aircraft everywhere. There's that same Catalina by the looks of it. There's R9. There's the HFDF station little driveway and the Butler, ha Butler hangar and the aircraft direction and Bayswater Road. Um, some B-25s lined up. Um, hangars R5, R6, R4. Uh, B-24 Liberator patched up piece with hangar R1 in the background. Um, Bob, I hope you got that photo. It's an F-7 photographic aeroplane. Is it? Right. Um, here we've got a disassembled uh, P-39 Air Cobra having a steam bath to soak, soak loose all the grime and grease uh, at the engine overhaul and repair shop at the air depot on the 25th of June. 1943. Um, two men working on a newly installed Allison V1710 engine and a P39 outside of the, you can see it up the top here, the engineering hangar of the second uh, service squadron uh, on the 25th of June 1943. Uh, this fellow here is applying a coat of liquid wax to the surface of an overhauled P39 outside the 4th Air Depot Group's engine overhaul and repair shop. And you can see, I think that's probably Castle Hill. It's an odd shape, but could be. Um, Duckworth Street, Bayswater Road running at right angles. You can see the aircraft erection hangar in the background and a B-17 and three B-24s. This one's missing a, a little bit at the back here, um, near hangar R-7 with Magnetic Island and many uh, sort of Palaranda out the back here. It's a B-18 Bolo, it's uh, serial number 36-343 called Damfino, D-A-M-F-I-N-O, which was Colonel Victor Batrandius's personal aircraft in early 1943. It had the glass bomb aimer station uh, converted to a solid metal nose. And he would often fly that um, B-18 to Eagle Farm Airfield, where the 81st Air Depot Group was uh, in Brisbane. And it was eventually scrapped in October 1943. You can see Mount Stewart here in the background. Uh, can um, I interrupt for a moment, Peter? That yes. pronunciation, it's damn fino. Mm-hmm, right. Damn fino. As in damn defino. Damn defino. There you go. 
I didn't know that. Thank you. Here we've got hangar R1, and if you look closely, I think that might be VIX uh, B18 Bolo again, uh, possibly. Uh, we've got some B24s here in the foreground, one of the, um, the cranes at the depot. Um, B17, um, and can you see the B18 again in the background there at the top left? Just on the other side of Duckworth Street, and you can just see here, I believe that's the um, shadow of the photographer standing on top of the crane uh, taking that photo. Uh, the B24 sitting under one of the two large cranes at the air depot, I'm not sure which crane. Um, C47 sitting under a crane, one of the two cranes. Now one of those two cranes was disassembled and went to the rocket range, Woomera, um, in South Australia in 1949. Rumour has it that the other one was buried on site, supposedly in a Telst an old Telstra depot, but I don't know whether that's true. It's uh, never been proven. Um, I've got some nice photos of the um, camp area um, coming up. You can see Magnetic Island in the background. Um, so this is part of the camp area. It goes around the corner to the right. And this is all the motor pool area here, just below Basewater Road and Garbutt Airfields over here in the distance and Palloranda out there. That's Rose Bay across here. Um, and in this one you get a much better view of the camp area. You can see pretty much all of the camp area. Castle Hill in the background and Bayswater Road. But you can also see quite a lot of the hangars if you look closely. So there's R4, R8, R1, R7, R9, R6. Um, and the Stockroot Airfield, of course, as well. So this is before 1944, um, but after 43, I'd say. So it's probably late 43. Another photo um, showing the um, the depot. You can see a couple of hangars over here in the background. One, two, three, and the aircraft direction hangar and the butler hangar there, and probably the other one up here somewhere. Castle Hill, of course. Uh, another shot, again, you can see lots of hangars with Bayswater Road and uh, vehicles parked here. Um, and this is the motor pool area um, in particular. Um, okay, the Townsall Air Depot was built adjacent to an existing railway line, as I mentioned earlier. It was built in 1926 and it came from Garbutt. So this is the main line heading to Ingham and they built this line in 1926 heading down here. Just happened to go right beside the air depot and the rest of it down here a bit further. Um, and that went to the Hubert Wells power station at Aikenvale, presumably to carry coal for the power station. Now if I just click you can now see the spur lines that the Americans built off that railway line to feed into this hangar here and to feed uh, over to something over here as well and over to here. I don't know what why it went to there. but um, So there's three spur lines in this area and there's another uh, one further down that I'll talk about shortly. So if you were to visit this area today, so this is the turn off to go to the domestic airport in Townsville. So you're coming from the city and you turn right. So there's an old building here which used to be the Melander Milk Factory. If you go on this back road here and just stop here and park and walk in here, you will see that stretch of railway line still there. It stops at the road. Uh, so that's the railway line that used to go to Hubert Wells and was used during the war to um, move um, in, uh, stuff to the uh, air depot. Um, and on the next slide that I'm going to show you, uh, there's someone has taken a photo from the top of this uh, igloo here, looking back along this railway line, this spur line that was built here. So there's that photo there, back to the um, to the main railway line with Castle Hill in the background. Um, and Jeff and I lived over somewhere over here somewhere, <laughs> probably over there. A really nice photo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look at all the tim uh, pipes and timber and see all the pipes over here. 
timber everywhere, there's stuff everywhere. Big crates here, I don't know what would have been in them. Um, and the other uh, rail loop was built um, down near the warehouse hangars and um, it was a short rail loop and they built um, two platforms. Um, so see one platform there and another platform just there. So it just came off the railway line that went to Hubert Wells Power Station and they used that to move goods and equipment uh, for these um, supply hangars that were located here. Looked like an aircraft hangar but it's not an aircraft hangar. Well, it wasn't used as one. Uh, these are two of the um, repaired uh, hangars that were on the southern side of um, the Stockwood airstrip back over here. That headquarters building is back over this way and there's another building about to be built here. Uh, here's an interesting photo. I don't know whether you noticed in that colour film earlier, it, you, if you are quick you would have noticed uh, when they were building one of the hangars, one of the trees poking up through uh, what they were building. So, uh, not sure why they did that, camouflage I suppose, I'm not sure. Um, here's R2 um, repair hangar and some of the local cows and by the looks of the vehicles that are parked there I'd say this is probably a post-war photo um, because those buildings, those hangars were used by various companies, paint companies and motor, motor vehicle uh, supply companies after the war. Um, they were all abandoned when I went, used to ride my push bike out there. Um, that's the R3 repair hangar. Uh, I don't know which hangar that is. Uh, it's behind that tree there. Uh, so there's a P38. I think it's a P38 and not an F4 or whatever it is. And that's uh, serial 43-2390. Some grasshoppers lined up. Look like they're in storage. Um, at the air depot, a couple of, um, I think these are the reconnaissance type lightnings at the air depot. There's some of the, I don't know what they are, um, I don't think they're the butler hangers, they're smaller ones, portable ones. Lodging. Yeah, they're, they're portable nose in hangers. Okay, yeah, I've only just noticed that. They're, they're too small to be the butler hangers. Here's one of the Silver Fleet, I think, uh, B-26 Marauder. Um, you can see Mount Stewart in the background there at the left. Uh, can't quite make out the first few numbers in the uh, tail number. Uh, that's just frame grabs from that earlier film footage that I showed you of some Catalinas at the depot. And this one here at the air depot is a Mitsubishi A6 M3 Zeke Type 32 that was rebuilt by the Allied Technical Air Intelligence Unit at Hangar 7 at Eagle Farm Airfield in Brisbane. It was flown to Townsville on at least one occasion and on that at least one occasion it was loaded onto an aircraft carrier called USS Kopahi which is the one that brought um, various disassembled aircraft uh, that I showed in those earlier slides. And by the way, those uh, aircraft carrier loads that I showed, they were only a few of them. I, I, they're only the ones that I could find with a little bit of researching. There would have been a, a lot more loads of aircraft delivered into Townsville. And I know the RAF also delivered aircraft um, by ship into Townsville. Um, so it boarded USS Copahe on the 27th of September 1943 and it was sent to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio for more testing uh, over and above what had happened uh, at Hangar 7. You can see a B-24 in the background there. Um, some, just a series of photos here. They're mostly, not, maybe not all of them, but mostly um, guys working on a B-24 Liberator called Pat Patches. Um, no idea it's Bomb Group. No idea, thank you. Was, was, is that Patches or was that a different aircraft? Uh, that's, that's it. I can give you the details when you, if you want okay. them for the future. Yeah, okay, later. Right, so it's had some sort of an accident. Um, yeah, there's patches still, so I think they're all the same aircraft. These are all high quality photos. I've reduced them down so I could fit four to a page instead of four slides, try and speed things up. Um, 
B24 into hangar R8. Some more general photos at the air depot, guys working on things, doing technical things. I would suggest it was a major overhaul. Yeah. Um, bit of a problem here. Um, they look like oxygen tanks there. Tail turret with a cannon strike. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, workshop area. These guys here are proudly sitting in front of the uh, 630th engine overhaul that they'd um, carried out at the depot. I don't know what date that is. Uh, just go back. Yeah, that's all right. And here, but here you go, Bob. Have you ever seen a coal-fired B twenty-four Liberator? <laughs> that's the steam cleaner. There you now you have. <laughs> it's, it's a classic photo. <laughs> um, there's some aircraft engine test stands uh, located uh, at the depot. Not quite the same as the ones at Eagle Farm, but similar. Um, they're obviously over near the warehouse um, hangars. Uh, on the southern side of um, uh, the Stockard airfield. So that's 24th of May, 1943. It's the propeller workshop. Uh, some overhauled propellers out in the yard uh, with a lifting gantry system that they've got. One of the many different varieties. There's a tent there in the background, open tent. Doing a hydromatic test on a propeller. Um, this guy's doing a um, sensitivity, checking the sensitivity of a tachometer at the air depot. This guy's using the very drive to comp testometer in the engine overhaul and repair shop. And this guy's getting a suntan, having a shave with his electric shaver sitting beside a Briggs and Stratton generator out in the open and the tiny apple bushes in the background that uh, Jeff would, Jeff and other townsville people would well know. All right, I've got a series of photos here of um, the salvage area uh, where there's all wrecked uh, aircraft and components of aircraft. So there's some P-39 Aerocobras here. Um, that's B-26 Marauder uh, Serial 40-1420 Murder Incorporated of the 19th Bomb Squadron 22nd Bomb Group, which crash landed at Garbard when its nose wheel failed on the 10th of February, 1943. This one um, is the B-24 Liberator 41-11869, one time of the 90th Bomb Group, which crash landed at Darwin on the 18th of March, 1943. Some more uh, wrecked aircraft bits and pieces nice white gun there some more um, bits and pieces looks like this photo might have been taken from one of the cranes maybe some more uh, wrecked aircraft okay remember i talked about the u.s navy magazine um, that area was later used as an aircraft burial pit for the air depot itself. They dug a hole about here, just there. Uh, so it's located just to the southwest, if you like, of the warehouse hangars at depot number two. Um, so after the Navy vacated that area, the, the depot used it to burn and bury unwanted aircraft parts and components. And there's the, um, the burial hole there, and you can see a couple of those uh, warehouse hangars there. Now, I've got a report here I'll read from the 12th Air Depot Group, dated the 16th of February 1945, which mentions this burial pit and an incident that happened there. And it goes and it reads as follows. As a solution to this problem of amassed material, destruction was the answer. Bulldozers were used to scrape out a large pit, so that's the uh, pit there. Into this pit <clears throat> were piled many items that were declared obsolete or of no further value. When an accumulation was stacked high, it was saturated with lubricants and ignited. 
set on fire, in other words. In this manner, it was possible to dispose of countless large objects that otherwise would have, been, ha, would have to be left dejectedly marring an expanse of Australian bush. All went well for a time. One of these fires proved fateful. As it ignited prematurely, throwing flames and metal parts many feet in the air. This explosion took place with such suddenness that men who were at work at the fire pit edge were severely burned and one body was found after the fire was extinguished. Nine others were immediately hospitalised. So just again, that's a plan showing where that magazine was and then the hole was built here uh, beside these um, air depot w w warehouse um, hangers. Now this is the same area and I, I did point out this um, park here, Heatley Park, uh, in one of the much earlier aerial photos. So this is the same area and I've overlaid that old, um, I think it was a 1952 aerial photo and there's the pit burial pit and that's where it is today in relation to Heatley Park. Um, and one of the local um, Purse, um, enthusiast in Townsville uh, did a magnetometer survey of the area um, and that's what it came up as. I'm not going to try and explain what it means but clearly there's something happening uh, right here and there may be a little bit happening here but th this is the main area of interest and that happens to line up with some stuff that was found um, back in 2019. So in about June, July 2019 a Townsville City Council contractor, uh, I've been in contact with him, exposed some World War II aircraft parts whilst excavating in Heatley Park to build a concrete walkway and delay some cables and an irrigation system. Whilst the bobcat being used pulled up a lot of pieces from just below the surface, the trenching machine they used found a great deal more at a, at a greater depth. Um, so the air depot was quite large, as you know, three to four thousand men, and they liked to play up a bit, and they'd often go to town. So the depot made a number of homemade buses, um, and this is one of them, um, towed by a big you know, truck, and that's parked um, right beside an air raid shelter you can see here in Flinders Street, uh, outside the old railway station, which is now decommissioned. And if you zoom in on the side of the bus, that's what it says. It says 4th Air Depot Group, 2nd Service Squadron, Garbutt Field. Even though they weren't really at Garbutt Field, they were, they were at Mount Louisa at the Air Depot. Uh, a couple of more buses sitting at the um, Air Depot beside one of the, um, one of the hangars. Um, there was a fairly large recreation hall, which was called Helton Hall, H-E-L. T-O-N, built at the air depot. It was named after 2nd Lieutenant James G. Helton, who was killed in a test flight of a B-25 Mitchell from the air depot. Uh, it crashed near Rattlesnake Island, um, not far from Townsville. Helton Hall also offered uh, letter writing facilities and held ping pong tournaments, etc, etc. And they held dan dances there every Sunday night. And uh, there's a close-up of that sign there for the grand opening that they had on the 26th of November, 1943. Um, this is Christmas time uh, at Helton Hall. I'm not sure which Christmas, probably 43 maybe. Um, two of the many stage, large stage shows that were held at Helton Hall were one uh, featuring Gary Cooper, Una Merkel and Phyllis Brooks, and the other was John Wayne and his uh, accompanying artist that uh, travelled with him. Um, other entertainers uh, visited the depot, uh, comedian Joey Brown, you can see at the left there in that photo, and Artie Shaw uh, and his orchestra, and I'll show some photos of him shortly, also visited the air depot. Uh, in February 1944, Five, the Townsville Air Depot presented a soldier show called That's All Brother to an audience of approximately 1,500 men. So there's Vic Petrandius who flew that B-18 Bolo. Uh, I don't know who this dude is. That's Joey Brown. 
Um, so you can see here on the 12th of August 1944, Jack Benny and Larry Edler and his troop, uh, they visited and performed at the depot and they played to approximately 4,000 men from all units in the area. So they must have had that out in the open, I guess. Seems like a lot of men. Um, here you can see Artie Shaw. This is at the air depot. Um, so American clarinet player, composer, band leader, author and actor. Artie Shaw played at the Townsville Air Depot. Look at the girls here standing to attention. So this is Artie Shaw and that's in there. An outdoor motion picture theatre was constructed at the Air Depot, so the projector was here and there's the tiny screen. Um, and um, the, the pictures became one of the favourite forms of relaxation for the men. Um, the Yanks were pretty good, they brought out the latest, flew out the latest movies from the States to show to the men. Um, so lots of fun was held there on the side of the hill. Um, a baseball league uh, was started in Townsville uh, during, at the Air Depot and you can see Mount Stewart there in the background. Um, so um, the US Army Special Services Unit also built two bitumen basketball courts and installed lights in what was then called Carlton Park on Queens Road in Townsville. The first uh, basketball games were played there in October 1943 and they established three basketball league comp competition leagues, each comprising eight teams. So it was a fairly big concern. Today that um, park is called Corcoran Park and I used to play basketball there uh, in the late 60s uh, before I moved to Brisbane. Uh, the other favourite pastime for the uh, men at the air depot was uh, riding horses. And the other thing you'll notice in this um, photo is um, why many people have thought this was the 4th Air Depot. You see the sign? 4th Air Depot Headquarters. It should say 4th Air Depot Group Headquarters. Of course, remember, the 4th Air Depot was in Darwin. So even the men there were a bit confused. So this was probably early in 42 um, or late, sorry not early, late 42 or early 43 before the 12th and the 15th Air Depot group arrived. Um, special Services Group of the 4th Air Depot group uh, initially put out a group newsletter called Arrowhead, Arrowhead sorry, and its popularity increased and with the arrival of the other two Air Depot groups they put out an, an overall depot newspaper uh, called Wing Tips, which you can see in this photo here. Just one of the pages of, um, I've got a number of copies of that, of those, some of those um, publications. Approximately 1,500 copies were distributed for each issue of that, um, that, mag of that newsletter, newspaper called Wing Tips. Uh, a couple, there's one of the, or a few of the large accommodation barracks um, at the Air Depot that were there by late 43. Uh, a few more photos, Mount Louisa in the background, um, and uh, another one again, a group photo, don't know what group it was, Mount Louisa in the background. So this shot's taken from the top of Mount Louisa. Early in the war, um, some of the anti-aircraft units uh, set up um, machine gun emplacements at a number of places um, at the Bowley and um, and all around Townsville and they put one machine gun emplacement on the top of Mount Louisa and this is an abandoned uh, one of those machine gun emplacements just above the air depot which is down here. There's a better photo of uh, one of those butler hangars uh, erected on the Stockwood airfield after 36 Squadron moved to Garbutt on the 20th of February 1944 the, um, the, these hangars could be erected in 12 to 18 hours. They were supplied in 13 boxes and you can see that it was canvas suspended from the steel, uh, lightweight steel truss uh, that was erected. Another shot of uh, butler hangars and you can see this one here on the Stockroot airstrip used to store um, goods um, during the later part of the war. 
So nearly finished. Uh, all that remains today of the Townsville Air Depot is this small memorial beside Duckworth Street. So this is one of the uh, foundations for one of the timber stringers uh, that that were in the big arch of the one of the big hangars, and uh, that's Duckworth Street there and Dalrymple Road up in the background here, uh, and a and a plaque uh, of sorts here on a stand, um, and there it is there again. So you can see that concrete. Uh, foundation thing there with Bunnings in the background and Super Cheap Auto on Duckworth Street in Townsville with Mount Louisa in the background. And that's a close up <clears throat> of that uh, sign um, at that memorial storyboard. And that's the end of my talk. I will stop that share and go back to. Seeing everyone, we've still got 28. I see a few people popped off. Uh, Warwick here, we had at least 34 people. 34? Good. Yep. Thank you. Any well, thank questions? you very much for that, Peter. That was very in enlightening to us all. And uh, not a lot, I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't realise just how important that depot at Townsville was for so long during the war. Mm, it was. Uh, 25 to 15 odd years ago, when I was flying through Townsville frequently, I saw those first. A lot of photographs taken during World War II by Arch, was it? The yeah, Arch for Arlington. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they're still, uh, there. That, they're still there, are they? That's great mm. to see. But they were very, very good photographs and quite a lot of them. I'm glad to see that they're, to hear that they're still on display at Townsville Airport. I think they're in a different location, but they're still there. Last time I was there, about two mm. years ago. Any, Any other comments, folks? Uh, yeah, uh, Peter, uh, thanks for that. What the, the book you held up at the beginning, could you just tell me again, please, the name of it and the author? No. The book is called Then, Now, Always. Then, now, Captain always. David Fredericks, the Air Force. The History and Heritage Group. All right, thank you. Well, all I can say is thanks, Peter. Uh, that has obviously developed a lot over the last few years. As, uh, I remember when we yeah, started, I I, started yeah. this, it was not as deep deep as that and you've done an extremely good job putting that all together yeah it's it's certainly changed uh since uh, when i delivered it about five years ago peter do you know where Breden is it's near charters towers there's there's uh, just just hang on tick there's that book um yeah thanks now, Peter. Yep. and now and always in big sky publishing all right i'll just stop that share now go back to that question uh, Breden, uh, it's near Charleston. Um, Breden, I have, my father was up there, and these are some of the sketches he did oh, yeah. um, of that area of Breden at the RAF, etc. Oh, okay. And I'd be very interested to know something about them. Okay. Um, well, if you send me an email, I'll uh, send you some information. Okay, so Char there's, um, there's Charters Towers, just there. I just saw Breden on the map, yes. And there's Breden up there. There it is up there, Breden Airfield. Okay. You can see I'll see, uh -huh. I'll see the remnants of the airfield there. So it's near the Burdekin, again. Near, not far from the Burdekin River on the Lind Highway. That's right. Yes, he had sketches of the huts and the airfield and uh, some of the ones that you showed in Townsville uh, yeah. in a small book that he did when he was up there. Right. Um, I've got lots of Google Earth markers, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is the air, there's, there's Garbutt Airfield, as it is today. Right. Um, yes. And the, the air depot. Fair was, enough. Air depot was down here, all on this area. I might try and get them into an email, and I'll send them up to you. Yeah. Okay. That'd be good. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. You, got, you got my Judy, email. Judy. Um, Breden. 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 Uh, Breton's very interesting in many ways, but to hear you tell me that your father, while he was there, made some sketches of buildings and so on is yes. is very important. It it um, uh, I, I've long been looking for the major repair structures buildings that were erected at Breton on the western end. And right. And these were erected from what was termed at the time distressed, right. distressed cargo. Uh, the distressed cargo apparently was virtually commandeered uh, steel, work, steel cargo from right. ships, ships that were 
commandeered for various reasons. Mm. And these structures apparently were built from the steelwork. So I would be very interested to see any sketches. Perhaps he sketched some of these repair structures. Can you see, can you see that drawing? Yes, I can. Uh, That's at Breden? Yes. The structures were in the bottom where the two runways intersect. Go right. left, go left, and you'll see a spur taxiway heading off towards the creek. Now, those structures I speak of were along that taxiway, and that's where the various aircraft were maintained or whatever. Now, would it be possible for your sketchbook to be uh, scanned so that uh, I could have a look at those sketches in due course? Certainly. Thanks. Certainly. Sorry, what was your name again? Roger Marks. Okay, um, I'll certainly scan them because they've sat in my um, um, in my library for years, and it was only when you started talking, and I thought, strike, Dad did drawings of all these places when he was up there. Good, thank you. Um, he was a trained artist in Edinburgh. Hey, Rod Roger, you can see the remains of one building here. True enough. True enough. There are, in fact, some uh, reinforced concrete buildings. At least two major ones still, mm. two major ones still at Britain, and there are eleven um, arch arch shaped uh, torpedo storage structures. Uh, oh right! Uh, yeah, okay. So it's quite an interesting place. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. Roger, are you talking about the buildings across the highway there, to the west, to the west yeah. of that road or highway? Yes. Yeah, there was uh, a couple of cantilever workshops there and a couple of bellman hangers there. I've actually been on that site. Is this, what you have any... is this the area you're talking about? That's it, yeah. That, yeah. Is, that, is, that is the area. So there's one. Yeah. There's another one. Yeah, right up the end there. There's something there. Was there. Can... There's another cantilever one. Cantilever hanger, cantilever There's workshop. another one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah I've been you... all over that. Yeah. Do you... I know you speak of some bellmans there, but the other ones, uh, bellmans I'm, I'm acquainted but I'm yep. curious about these other ones because I suspect they were uh, unique structures. Well, the work, the workshop hangers, the work, sorry, the cantilever workshops. I've actually just built a, a model of one of those. Mm -hmm. They, um, I had a hell of a time finding drawings of them. Uh, Peter helped me out a lot with photos because there was one in Townsville, there was a couple at Breden, there was a couple at Macrossan, there was a couple mm -hmm. at Labian, um, they were proper buildings. They weren't made from scrap or anything like that. They, there was proper working drawings and everything for those buildings. Mm. They were oh, on I, that I, the highway. Yeah. I didn't mean the distressed cargo to represent scrap. It was yeah. steel, steel <laughs> but it, it became available to the authorities. Okay. Well, the cantilever workshops were uh, timber framed. Okay. Well, again, uh, I'm interested in the in the uh, uh, Breton ones, because yep. somewhere I read that they were steel frame structures. There was steel, well, th those ones at Breton were definitely timber on, on that side, the cantilever workshops. Um, okay. There's a few photos of them floating around. Um, <laughs> there's uh, not many though, they're all taken from the distance. There's one showing what we think is inside, because um, Bill, I've been talking to Bill Henderson. I know Bill quite well, and I've actually been there with Bill to Breton. Um, there you go, Roger. Yes. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. Yeah. Aircraft that's workshop. That's, yeah, that's certainly the area of which I'm acquainted. Yes. There's a bell, one Bellman hangar there, Bellman hangar there, Bellman hangar there. Aircraft yep. workshop, aircraft workshop, aircraft workshop, aircraft workshop. And there's that big one that I showed earlier, whatever that is. There is there is a couple of little ancillary buildings around there that you know we've got no details on at all. So they could have been what you refer to, Roger. Mm, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Photos would be useful in due course, yes. Um, I'll see what I can track down for what I've got. I, I mm. they um yeah, it's interesting, Brendan. There's it's hard getting information on it. Very hard. And then we, we suspect, Bill and myself, that a lot of the buildings that are shown on the drawings weren't built, and some were built. And uh, you can only basically go from the slabs that are on the ground there now, and that's it, you know. 
I take it you've not visited Bellman and Peter, Peter Johnson. Yeah, that, no, I've been to no, Braddon. Sorry, I, I take it you've not visited Braddon. Yes, yeah, I've been there. Well, have you gone around the circuit to the yep. southeast where the torpedo yeah, storage yeah, structures been there. Okay. I've, yeah, okay. yeah, been there. That's that, that concrete um, semi-arch type building, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, um, uh, Bill took us right over the whole lot. We walked the whole thing, but it was bloody hot. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, been right right around that. But mind you, it was nearly twenty years ago now. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. So sometimes, sometimes I think I remember things and I find that I didn't. <laughs> so. Okay. Any other questions on the towns or air depot? Peter, not necessarily a question, but um, it may be of interest to. Uh, listeners here to, at the moment uh, to uh, make clear that the photographs, many of the photographs that you showed carry in their bottom right corner a little white number. Often the number there will be prefaced with an A and or an AC. And these are photos that were generated uh, during the war, of course. And they the interesting thing is that they're part of the only section uh, that was uh, digitized and is therefore available online. Yep. Um, most of the American uh, photography of that nature is not digitized and not available online, but that particular Air Corps section was. Yep. It was known uh, as the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, US Air Force uh, pre-1954 photo collection up until uh, the time uh, that it was loaned to the um, National Air and Space Museum people who tried to put it on a, a uh, an optical disc system. And uh, as a result, even though they failed in that way, yep. even though the work they did, that's why it is now available online. It's available online, I think, uh, probably under the uh, search of um, Fold Fold Three or Threefold, whichever that. Fold was. Three, Fold, Fold three. three, is it? Yeah. yeah. But it's certainly part of the uh, U.S. Uh, archive system, uh, so it's it's available online. So that's my message. Yeah, this particular photo is one out of the um, collection at College Park, um, so it's. Um, the SC forty three Super yep. Series, which your uh, SC is Signal Corps. Yeah, that's right. Yep. If you go to um, College Park in Washington DC, um, where the NARA office is, you can go up on the. I think it's the first floor. Um, there's a um, there's an index um, sort of cabinet, absolutely full of cards. Thousands and thousands of photos. Roger knows them well. I've been there and Roger's been there. And there's tens of thousands of photos taken by the Signal Corps in Australia during World War II. Um, and, you know, this one here is just one of them. I, I've got quite a few. Roger's got quite a few as well. And I know another bloke who's got some. So, uh, some incredible photos. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Enjoy the evening. Thank and you. they're very nice to even put uh, Latin long on it. Yeah, they do, yeah, with some of them, yeah. Yep. It was very useful for me to identify something in Caledonia once. <laughs> this is one of the ones that are available online that Roger was talking about. Um, That's a typical, yes. Yeah. Yeah, Fold3 website is quite good. I'm, I, I subscribe to it. I had actually just redid my subscription the other day. Uh, when they had a discount offer out. So, what cost, Peter? Uh, 49 US dollars. Annual? Annual. Yeah, the, and, and if you're interested in US Navy, it's got heaps of information on US Navy. Uh, war diaries for ships and aircraft carriers and submarines. and There's heaps of stuff. Absolutely incredible. Not so good for war diaries of um, Air Force units, but they're starting. They've started to put some 90th bomb group stuff up there just recently actually um and a few other squadrons right oh, i think we're probably finished um 
the air depot part and we'll just leave it open for general discussion. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Peter. Uh, Warwick here, just uh, going to mention again for everybody, four weeks time, 25th of February, we'll have Dr. Tom Lewis, OEM, and his topic will be intriguing topic of Japanese aviators who stay. So you'll join us again. Anyway, the formal meeting is closed and as Peter says, we can have chat amongst ourselves and anything else you'd like to bring up.